we are live now. Yeah, preparing to live stream the meeting. That's very good. Okay. So, hello everyone. Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whenever you are or wherever you are. This is Mohammed Nabil, um, a teacher educator, a professional development consultant, and the founder of, of Educast EG platform and podcast. Uh, today we have a wonderful guest. Um, he is Dr. Raif Sof Azab. He's a PhD holder and he works at uh, Dumyat University. He has worked uh, in different places. He taught different uh, students from different levels in different places. He has a very, uh, you know, very big experience in teaching. Um, uh, maybe uh, he taught adults. He has taught adults more than any other level, right, Dr. Roy? Yeah. yeah true, true. Yes, yes, very good. Okay, so before we start, let me tell you about uh, our vision and mission in EduCast. So uh, our mission in EduCast is uh, to provide the best training to aspiring educators so that they may achieve great heights in their chosen area. We take great care in providing quality training for existing and future educators to make them capable of handling students of all calibers, calibers and uh, circumstances. Um, our vision is to make education affordable and obtainable for people from all backgrounds. Our effort is to always bring forward the latest methodology uh, of teaching for every teacher. We want to ensure that they are equipped with the knowledge of established as well as up and uh, common techniques of teaching. The goal is to make the educator proficient and globally viable. And of course, in EduCast, we provide uh, you uh, with professional development, development webinars, um, you know, presented by the best in this field in Egypt and outside Egypt from different countries uh, from all over the world. And also, yeah, there will be some teacher training courses. I'm going to be telling you about this at the end of this webinar. There are lots of surprises. Yeah. So again, as I said before, uh, the webinars will stay for free as long as I'm alive. And of course, we will have some teacher training courses with, you know, small fees so that the whenever or uh, or uh, whoever, whoever wants to learn, you know, finds what he is looking for here with us, inshallah. Okay, so Dr. Raif, today we have a wonderful book, right? We're discussing a wonderful book, uh, yeah. which is uh, How Languages are learning right yeah yeah so could you please uh tell our guests today or uh the attendees today about how this session will go okay thank you um is the session recorded because someone yeah, is sure. yeah we're live on facebook so the, the they can find the recording uh on the page once Wonderful. it's finished yeah uh, okay thank you um uh, good evening uh, hello hello everyone first i would like to uh, extend a sincere vote of thanks to Mr. Mohammed, uh, the founder of Educast, this promising ELT uh, platform for his nice, uh, lovely intro, and uh, for giving me this chance, this wonderful chance to be with you today. Second, I would love to welcome everyone attending. Thank you so much for coming, for caring to attend. And I hope you find the session uh, useful, inspiring, and anything of great value. How languages are learned. Uh, can I share the screen now? Because I have uh, yeah, just something to share. Yeah, okay. just a second. Okay. So, yeah, you can share the screen now. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Okay, can you see the slides? Okay, thank you. How languages are learned. Um, actually, this is uh, the big, the big title of a series of upcoming sessions that are going to be delivered by me every month. And today is this first session, and there will be one session per per month. So 
uh, stay tuned for uh, more sessions per month on how languages are learned. But let me be frank with you, this is, this is not the title of the sessions, this is originally the title of one of the most, uh, or let's say one of the greatest books ever written on second language learning and teaching. And this book is written by two great uh, pioneering ELT figures who are specialized in the major, or let's say in the field of second language learning and teaching. And they are Professor Patsy Lightbaum and Professor Nina Spada. Okay. Um, we have lots of things to say today, but uh, again, this is an intro. This is the first session. So I, of course, I'm not going to cover everything. I'm not going to say, uh, or let's say tackle uh, the book today, but just it's just an intro and there will be break for 10 minutes. And then after the break, we will have uh, a discussion of the first chapter, or let's say some points in the first chapter, chapter one. Okay, let's start. Okay, um, the, session for, the session for today is mainly focusing on giving all attendees a solid knowledge about the book and the authors in general. Then it will move to a discussion of some points that are being covered in the first chapter of the book. Allow me to start with some questions that will furnish us with a foundation of knowledge about the book. And the first question, as you see, how did the idea for writing the book start? Um, in the author's words, Professor Patsy and Professor Nina Spada, in their own words, the book started, or let's say the idea behind writing the book started in the late 80s. And when, when, when the authors were, were both teaching university courses in second language learning and teaching, and they were asked by the Ministry of Education in the province they were both teaching to prepare a series of modules for teachers about how languages are learned. The main purpose was that how teachers could use these modules, these materials with their coordinators so that they could get access to second language acquisition research that would be relevant and related to their teaching without having to take a university course. Besides the material, uh, the modules were designed in a way that anyone could take and use in class or in any teacher training programs, and there would be no need for any kind of supervision on how to handle. The idea of putting these modules into the form of a book as a publication was not primarily intended by the authors. What happened was that the modules were used in a variety of different teacher training programs. Later, they became popular. They appealed to a wide audience in different places outside Canada because Canada was the place of residence of these two uh, professors. And then the book became so popular among ELT professionals. Finally, the book was published by OUP, Oxford University Press, in the 90s, and since then, the book proved to be a great success as it came out into different editions. Second question is, what is the main theme? What is the main idea of the book? This second language acquisition research, how languages are learned, has been based on so much classroom research, classroom observations, and feedback given from both teachers and learners. And that's why this book, in fact, it bridges the gap between pedagogical practice and theory on second language learning. It actually combines the two as it seriously takes into account how second language learning research could be more accessible, meaningful, 
and relevant to teachers. How languages are learned, this book, it's, it's really fundamental for ALT professionals at, as it practically tackles not only how learners learn, but how teachers teach as well. And that relationship between the two. In other words, the book centers on any structured second language acquisition. And to put it another way, how in instruction, or let's say, um, what kind of instruction affects the way we learn languages and how it helps learners learn languages successfully. The third question, who are the authors? As I said before, the book was written by two ALT professors to pioneering names in the field of second language learning and second language acquisition. The first one we have here is Professor Patsy Lightbaum, and she is professor at Concordia University in Canada. She has been working for more than 40 years in the fields of language teaching and language learning. And her research has focused on the teaching and learning of second and foreign languages in classroom contexts. She is a writer, editor and a researcher. Her 2014 book, Focus on Content-Based Language Teaching, published by Oxford University Press. This book was shortlisted for the English Speaking Union's Duke of Edinburgh Book Prize in Applied Linguistics and runner-up for the British Council Award for English Language Teaching. Professor Lightbound has published scores, many articles, on her research in professional journals and books. Some of these articles are compiled in Learning a Second Language in the Classroom, published by the Shanghai Foreign Language Education Press in 2014. She is also an educational consultant and advisor. And she worked and she gave advice to uh, so many government agencies, teachers, policymakers, curriculum developers, administrators, university foreign language departments, school boards, and evaluators of second and foreign language instructional programs. Professor Lightbound has given workshops and presentations to a broad range of audience in the US, Canada, Mexico, and several European countries, Japan, and Australia. The audience was in-service and pre-service teachers, as well as program developers and administrators. And she has taught university level short courses on language acquisition, uh, teacher education, language pedagogy, and research on language teaching and learning for both graduate and undergraduate students. Professor Light, let's now move to Professor Nina Spada. Uh, Professor Nina Spada, she is Professor in second language education program at, o, at OISE, um, Ontario Institute for Studies in Education, University of Toronto, where she teaches graduate and undergraduate courses in second language learning and teaching. Her research investigates whether there are more effective ways to draw learners' attention to language in communicative instruction, and if different ways of focusing on language leads to different types of second language knowledge and ability. Professor Spada has participated in a number of international projects related to the teaching of le and learning of second and foreign languages, including those sponsored by the World Bank and the European Commission on the Teaching and Learning of Second Foreign Languages. She is co-editor of two book series, the first book is Oxford Key Concepts for the Language Classroom. And the second one is Language Learning and Language Teaching, published by Joan Benjamins. The last question is, how is the book organized? Um, just to be brief, uh, the book starts with a snapshot of description, a snapshot description of learner language, looking closely at what happens actually in the classroom and, and what learners do 
what learners and what teachers actually do in classrooms as they move from no knowledge, from zero knowledge to more sophisticated knowledge, looking at individual differences and understanding how these differences affect the way people learn and how these differences uh, affect what learners can ultimately able to do and able to learn. Having this kind of background knowledge or grounding prepares the reader, whoever they are for the learning theories, which explain why things happen this way. Um, contents, the central, the central areas, or let's say the central themes that are being covered in the book are the following. Start with chapter one. Chapter one is entitled Language Learning in Early Childhood. The book begins with a chapter on language learning in early childhood. And in this chapter, we have a background. And this background is really important because both second language research and teaching have been influenced by how we understand our comprehension of how children acquire the first language. That's why we need to start with this chapter to understand second language acquisition, which will come later in the following chapters. Several theories about first language learning are presented in this chapter. As you can see, we have three main theories. And these theories will come later again. They are revisited in the book later in relation to second language learning. The chapter covers other areas as language disorders and delays and childhood bilingualism. Chapter two. Chapter two, second language learning. In this chapter, we focus on second language learners developing knowledge and use of their new language. We begin by looking at the different contexts for first and second language learning, as well as different characteristics of learners in these contexts. We examine some of the errors that learners make and discuss what errors can tell us about their knowledge of the language and their ability to use that knowledge. We also look at stages and sequences in the acquisition of some syntactic and morphological features in the second language. We also review some aspects of learner's development of vocabulary, pragmatics, and phonology. The third chapter now, the third chapter is individual differences in second language learning. In this chapter, chapter three actually tackles some of the studies that have sought to understand the relationships between individual differences and learning outcomes. In other words, how individual learner differences or characteristics may affect success? And to what extent can we predict differences in the success of second language acquisition? If we have information about learners' personalities, their general and specific intellectual abilities, their motivation, or their age. We will cover later some research on learner characteristics tackling some issues as intelligence, aptitude, learning styles, personality, attitude, motivation, etc. Finally, the chapter ends with a discussion of age and second language instruction. Chapter four, chapter four, explaining second language learning. In chapter four, we explore some of the theories that have been offered, offered sorry, to account for second language development progress, developmental progress and final learning outcomes. We will look at how the behaviorist and initist explanations for first language acquisition that we covered in chapter one, how these have been extended to account for second language acquisition. 
We will also look at some theories from cognitive psychology that have increasingly informed second language research in recent years. These theories emphasize the way the mind perceives, retains, organizes, and retrieves information. Finally, we will look at sociocultural theory, a perspective that places second language acquisition in a larger social context. Chapter five, explaining second language learning. Sorry, uh, chapter five is observing learning uh, in the sec second language classrooms. Yeah. This, this, this chapter explores different ways in which researchers have observed and described what goes on in second language classrooms. And to do this, the chapter first takes a moment to reflect on the differences between classroom settings for language learning and other, other settings where people learn a new language without any instruction. We then examine some different ways in which researchers have observed and described teaching and learning practices in second language classrooms. Chapter six, chapter six, this is uh, the last one before last. Second language learning, second language learning in the classroom. Chapter six examines six proposals. As you can see, we have six proposals for teaching. These six proposals are being examined in chapter six. And these six proposals have been made for second language teaching. Examples of research related to each of the proposals are presented, leading to a discussion of the evidence available for assessing the effectiveness. The chapter ends with a discussion of what research findings suggest about the most effective ways to teach and learn a second language in the classroom. Then we come to the last one, the final one, chapter seven. This is the last chapter in the book. It's entitled Popular Ideas About Language Learning Revisited. In this chapter, we will provide a general summary of the book by looking at how research can inform our response to some popular opinions about language learning and teaching that will be introduced in just a minute. That's it. Um, before we take a break, because I'm sure that you need break after this long theoretical, or let's say this uh, long period of information. Before we take break, uh, there is an activity that I would like you to do as a warm up. It's 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 a it's a warm up activity that will help me and you as well. Um, let's say um, discover how much knowledge you have and what beliefs you already have on second language learning and teaching. This is the activity and I need you to read the instructions, indicate the extent to which you agree, okay, to the following statements. State in the chat box your opinion, okay? Uh, we will do the, this activity uh, right now, okay? So I will not give you time. Uh, I need to, I need to, uh, actually I need to uh, not to waste much time. So, uh, Let's start with the first one, the first sentence. I, I need you to write in the chat box. If you agree, write A. If you disagree, write D. If you strongly agree, write SA. And if you strongly disagree, write SD. Sentence number one, read and write what you think. A, S, A, S, A, A, S, A, A, S, A. Say, so we have agree and strongly agree. And just one disagree. Hmm. Languages are learned mainly through imitation. We, we're not going to discuss this right now. This will come, this will be explored later when starting with the book because the book will 
answer all these issues, will cover all these issues. Agree. Okay, so uh, we have agree and we have strongly agree. Okay. Next one. Hmm. Read and write. Parents. Agree, disagree. Okay. Disagree, strongly. <laughs> disagree, okay. You do not agree. We have different opinions. Okay. Disagree, agree. Wow. Disagree. <laughs> agree. Okay. Nice. Okay. Sentence three. Mm -hmm. Highly intelligent people are good language learners. What do you think? Disagree strongly. Disagree. Okay, so you don't think that intelligent people are good language learners. Agree, only one. Marwa Saif says that she agrees with this statement. She thinks that highly intelligent people are good language learners. Wow, only one. Okay, hmm. Good, nice. Let's move to... Number four, we have lots of sentences, by the way, about 18 sentences. Motivation is the key word. What do you think? Is it everything? Is motivation the most important? It is important, but is it the most important? Agree. Disagree, agree, strongly agree, different opinions. Okay, agree, disagree, okay, disagree. Okay, so some, some, some of you do not agree that motivation is the most important factor of success or predictor. Um, Marwa says, somehow agree, Nisma, strongly agree. Okay. Okay, so it, it seems that this is a controversial issue. Okay, this will, be, this will be covered. This will be covered later in the book. We will talk about that in detail. Okay, uh, five. We are just warming you up. Mm -hmm. Amira says, strongly agree, strongly agree, agree, strongly agree. Okay, so between agree and strongly agree. Doa says, disagree. The earlier, the greater. But beware, in school programs, in school settings, in classrooms, in classroom contexts, not outside the classroom. Be the sentence again. Agree. Agree. Okay. Thank you. Motivation accelerates second language learning. Second language acquisition, yeah, true. But is it the most important? Number six, 
Mm -hmm. What do you think? Reham, agree, Amira, agree, Omnia, disagree, agree, strongly. <laughs> I cannot follow. Okay. Yeah, true, Omar, I agree. Most of the mistakes are due to interference. So uh, what do you think? Is first language responsible for the mistakes? There are many reasons. Strongly agree. Okay. Seven. To learn new vocab, not to learn a second language. To learn new vocab. Through reading. Disagree. Disagree. Agree, Fatma. Okay. Not only reading, Amira. Okay. Strongly agree, Marwa. Dalia, Mona, Zainab, agree. Okay. Eight. It's essential for learners. Learners, not teachers, for learners. Agree, disagree, strongly agree, agree, strongly agree, Omar, strongly disagree. Okay. So some 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 statements uh, are not agreed upon by you. Okay. Different, we have different views. Okay. Good. Nine. What do you think? Noor strongly disagree, and Marwa agrees with Noor. Fatma disagree. So do you think that knowing 1,000 words in the basic structure is uh, enough for learners to, to converse with native speakers? It's not about the numbers. So uh, yeah, we have to be active vocab. Okay, good. It would not be perfect, but the native will understand. Okay, nice. Nice ideas. Okay, thank you. 10. Next one. Do I disagree? Fatma, agree. Mm -hmm. Explain the first statement, please. Which, which statement? Teachers, number 10. Agree, partially agree. Yes. So you, you need me to go back? Agree, disagree. We can compare rules, Marwa. Okay. Agree. Okay. Disagree, Mr. Walid. Okay. Good. Next, 11. It depends on the stage. Okay. Hmm, 11.
Iman strongly agree. Amira, Marwa agree. Amal agree. Rehem, this strongly agree. Sora, Zainab strongly. Hadir agree. Nibras agree. Hayam agree. Okay. Aisil agree. Dua disagree. Agree. Agree. You are different. You have different opinions for number 11. Okay. 12. Agree, but with young learners. Okay. Hmm. 12. What do you think? Strongly agree, agree, agree. Should learners' errors be corrected as soon as they are made? It depends on the activity. Okay, nice. Thank you, Iman. Strong disagree. Disagree, disagree. Agree, disagree. To encourage fluency, disagree. Okay. Disagree for sure, as it depends. It depends on the level. So it depends on lots of things, okay. Accuracy or fluency, <laughs> okay. According, <coughs> sorry, according to the activity, okay. Thank you, 13. Agree, agree, Muhammad and Rehem, Noor, Disagrees, so here agree, Nesma disagree, Omnia strongly disagree. Okay, strongly disagree. Again, it depends. Sara disagree, Hanan agree, Fatma, Amel disagree, Fatma agree. Okay, Libras agree, disagree. Okay, mm -hmm. I can see that you do not agree on most statements. Agree and disagree, <laughs> Amira. Okay. 14. 14. Disagree, Iman. Disagree, Ines. I am. Disagree. Disagree, disagree, strongly, disagree, disagree, strongly, disagree, 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 not necessarily, Marwa. Nesma is the only one who says agree, the only one, Nesma. Okay. Uh, Zainab, disagree. Dalia, disagree. All of you, uh, except Nesma, agree, Noor. So you, ha you have a friend here, Nesma especially with weak students, okay. It's some sort of feedback, okay. Hmm. 15, sometimes, 15, okay, thank you. Doha agree that students learn what they are taught, agree, strongly agree. Summer agree, Reham disagree, Amira not already, not always, sorry, Noor disagree, always, okay, not always, Amal disagree, Umnaya disagree, students learn what they are taught, what they are being taught by teachers, okay, agree, Dalia says what they see, okay, not all the time, Miss Fatma, okay, thank you. 16, we still have uh, two sentences left. 16. Agree. Agree. Amen, agree. Those questions are about humans, so you can't set fixed rules. Okay. Hmm. 
Agree sometimes, depends on the task. Agree, disagree, agree, agree, agree. Lots of, lots of agreements. Lots of agreements. Okay. Okay, good. Okay. Mm, nice. The one before last, we are almost finished, 17. My allowances to correct themselves, okay. Mm -hmm. 17 now, strongly agree, strongly agree, strongly agree. Agree, strongly agree, quite agree. <laughs> okay, good, thank you, lovely. Lovely, wonderful. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for being active. Yes, this is the CLIL, clearly. Um, hmm, 18. This is the last one. Agree, disagree, 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 strongly agree, agree, disagree. Okay, nice. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you all for, for being active and for participating in this in this activity, these are some some statements that um, really reflect some second language learning and teaching issues. And of course, these these issues will be covered in in the book. It's just a warm up activity. Okay, nice. Would you like to take a break or just move uh, right away to the first chapter? What do you think? Break? Yes or no? Just write in the chat box. Yes or no? No, no breaks. We are eager to know. No, no, no. Okay. No break. Let's start. Okay, nice. Okay. Thank you. I'll share something else, with, which is um, another, another document, chapter one. Just give me a second. Oh, can, can you see the slide now, chapter one? Can you see the slide, chapter one? Yeah, I can see it here, yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, so let's start. Um, chapter one. Um, as we said before in the, in the intro, uh, chapter one, uh, this is uh, about language learning in, in early childhood. And in this chapter, we will just look briefly at the language development of young, young children, babies or toddlers. We will then consider several, several theories that have been offered as explanations for how language is learned. Actually, th there, is, there is a great amount, a great amount of research on child, child language. But our purpose, our purpose in this chapter is just to touch on a few main points in this research, uh, primarily as a preparation for the discussion of second language acquisition. That's why we are starting, starting with uh, first language. So we will not start right away with second language learning and teaching, but chapter one is all about uh, first language acquisition, just to prepare ourselves as readers for the coming chapters, which is the core of the book. Okay, um, 
this is again the contents these are the ideas and the issues that are going to be covered of course i'm not going to cover all of these tonight but maybe chapter one uh, i'm not sure but maybe chapter one uh, will be covered in three or four sessions which means three months because we will have one session per month okay so let's start with language acquisition and let, let me let me uh ask you this simple question. What do you think? What, what is language acquisition? Can you give me just a simple definition of language acquisition? What do you think? Write in the chat box. Exposure to language, okay. Learning more about language. Mm -hmm. Is it learning a language or learning about language, Amira? How we get language, how to use different skills of language, Doha. Okay, thank you. And Iman, how we get language, thank you, man. Getting the language, okay. Marwa, thank you. What do you mean by getting? Marwa, what, 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 what do you mean by getting the language? Uh, Marwa Sawi, children's or learner's ability. Okay, uh, I need I need to go up. Um, learn how to practice a language, storing and imitating children's or learner's ability to learn a language. Okay, uh, how we receive Sarah language and be able to produce it nice do i ability to use ability to produce words and sentences i think it's about okay be able to use it getting the language as if language transforms from the speaker to the listener okay be able to use it okay good thank you okay um nice nice definitions thank you thank you all the capacity to perceive and produce language. Yes, yes, uh, I agree with the last definition. This is the best definition ever I found on language acquisition. It's it's a process, okay? Uh, it's a process, uh, and and we when we look at the word process, why is it a process, and what do we mean by process? Process it means that it has stages. It doesn't happen suddenly. It takes time, okay? So. Uh, when you acquire when you acquire a language you you should you should uh take into consideration that this this uh this uh, uh idea of acquiring or learning a second language it takes some time it's a process okay and it's the process by which humans have the capacity they are able they can perceive they can understand, perceive means, they can understand or they can uh, think in a certain way about the language and comprehend a language. So this is uh, a simple definition of language acquisition. So again, language acquisition, this is the process by which we all as humans can perceive and comprehend a language. Okay, nice. So, this ability uh, of perceiving, or let's say this ability of communicating, communicating effectively and meaningfully in a target, in a target, in a target language. This, this ability is really important. This is about language acquisition. So when, when we say language acquisition, we refer to your ability of being able to communicate with others in an effective and meaningful way in the target language. If you are learning Spanish, if you are learning French, or if you are learning German, these are all languages which are, which are different from your first language. If your first language is Arabic, for example, so French, Spanish, German, English, and so on, these are the target languages. That's why, that's why language acquisition, this is something really uh, impressive it's an outstanding feature of human development so 
language acquisition language acquisition is in itself something remarkable it's something impressive it's an outstanding uh, uh, characteristic of human development it's it's a it's a cognition that truly makes us human that is capable of progress and let's say that uh, language acquisition is is it's it's a common it's uh, it's a common and it's a remarkable feature of our daily life. And it starts with old babies. It starts with old children. Okay. Uh, when, when, not with young babies, it starts with old babies when, when, when they start babbling. You know, you know the word babble, B A W B L E, when, when they start babbling which means when they start uh, talking in a way uh, that is difficult for us as parents, as friends, as relatives uh, uh, to understand. You know, you know this time, this, this period when, when old babies start talking uh, in a way that you find it difficult to understand, you, you understand nothing. So this is how it, how it starts. That's why it's, it's something common, very common. It's something remarkable feature of our daily life. And, and when, these, when these old babies uh, talk this way, they, they make meaningless sounds. Yes, talking nonsense talk. They, they make nonsense talk, nonsense, let's say sounds, not talk, just sounds. You, you, you listen to uh, meaningless sounds. And they sometimes, sometimes they uh, say, or let's say they utter meaningless words like ba 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 ma 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 ma. These are just meaningless words, uh, which makes uh, parents, of course, uh, happy and proud. Okay, and actually, this 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 raises uh, a number of questions to think about. The first question is, how do children? do this how do children achieve this what is the process how does this happen and the second question is what what makes a child not only to learn words but to put them of course at a later stage in meaningful sentences the third question is what makes children develop complex grammatical language patterns, even though their early simple communication is successful. So their early communication is fine, it's, it's okay. So what makes them develop more complex grammatical structures and patterns? What motivates them? What pushes them to do this? Next question is, does child language develop similarly around the world? So if we have a child in, in Africa, in African countries, and we have another one in a European country or, or in European countries. So do children in different countries develop the same way? And the last question is, how do bilingual children who speak more than one language, acquire more than one language? How do bilingual, how, 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 how does this happen? How do children who speak more than one language, how do they acquire? How does this happen? What is the, how does, does this process happen? Okay, so what happens? Okay, um, let's start with, with the first uh, point in chapter one or let's say uh, delve deeper to find out more about these issues. Okay, um, let's, let's uh, start my discussion today with, by saying that uh, children all over the world, all over the world, and this is, this, is not, this is not what I think, this is what the authors, what the authors, Professor Spada and Professor Lightbound think, and this is what they said in the book. They said that children all over the whole world in their first three years, okay? 
in the first three years, age one, two, and three, between one and two. In during this period, children have a high degree of similarity. They have a high degree of similarity in terms of language development. So the, the, they develop their language similarly. And uh, how, how, how does it start? Uh, the earliest, or let's say, the earliest mark is the involuntary crying of babies. So what happens first? They cry and they cry involuntarily. Involuntary means suddenly, without any previous intention, without any planning, uh, without having any control. Okay, so they cry suddenly. Uh, and this is the first mark. This is the earliest mark. And then after this, we have some sounds and these sounds are called cooing and gurgling sounds. I can't, I can't, I can't actually do these sounds. I, I know the sounds, I know how the sounds are made and I know how the sounds sound, but you, you can go to YouTube and listen to cooing and gurgling sounds. Uh, coo, uh, this is a verb and actually this is, uh, the sound made by a pigeon. So I need you to, to imagine. And gurgle, uh, this is how babies make, make a noise in their throat when they are happy. After this, we have uh, this development in their language development. Uh, children, but before, before, before we, before we uh, go to this point, I need to, to develop more on the previous, uh, uh, previous idea. At this stage, at this stage where, where children make cooing and gurgling sounds, at this stage, children have, they have little control. They cannot control the sounds they make, okay? So they have no control. They have little control over the sounds, these cooing and gurgling sounds. However, Although they have little control, they are so sensitive. Their ears are so sensitive to the sounds they hear. They listen attentively and they imitate. And when they imitate the sounds they listen to, they have little control. They can hear the differences between the sounds of human being. They can distinguish between the sounds. For example, I'll give you an example. Um, um, they, can, they can distinguish the voice of the mothers from those of others, uh, other speakers. And they can, they can even um, hear the difference between uh, single sounds, single similar sounds as p and h. They can know the difference between p and ha. The, these or h, these are uh, single similar sounds. What is, uh, what is more interesting is that, and this is really, really important, and I need you to listen uh, attentively to this point. What, what is interesting is that they do not react to the differences between sounds which are not phonemic in the first language. Again, again, they do not react to the differences between sounds which are not are not phonemic in the first language. Um, of course, we we uh, I think that we all speak Arabic. Um, I, I think all the attendees, except few ones, uh, speak Arabic as their first tongue. So babies, babies who will become speakers of Arabic, they they do not respond. They do not react to the differences between p. P A P and H H A because we do not have P in Arabic. We do not have this sound P. We have B, like Bab, like uh, Batiha, like Burtukala, uh, like uh, anything that have uh, that has a sound B. But we do not have P sound. That's why when when he hears uh, someone saying 
P, he cannot react, or let's say he doesn't react to the difference because this sound is not phonemic in Arabic. On the other hand, on the other hand, babies who hear more than one language can respond to the difference. So it depends on what, what they hear. And this, this ability of distinguishing between sounds is due to much interaction with human speakers. So the more, the more children and old babies listen to real humans, not uh, listening to electronic devices, we, we, we are uh, focusing on listening to real humans. The more they listen to humans, the better they react and distinguish between sounds. Okay, back to developmental stages of language learning of children. Um, by the end, by the end of the first year, when they are one years old, children start to understand, or let's say most babies start to understand quite a few frequently repeated words in the language spoken around them. So this is the period, this is the stage where uh, young or let's say old babies start to uh, start a process of comprehension. So before this, before this, they just cry, they just make sounds, but when they become one, when they are uh, aged one, they start a process of comprehension or comprehending quite a few repeated words. For example, uh, I'll give you an example. Um, when someone, when someone, uh, anyone says bye, uh, they start to wave. They start to wave, move their hands and wave. Uh, if someone says clap, they will clap. Uh, if someone in the family, for example, says uh, apple, orange, uh, cheese, milk, they, uh, they, they start hurrying to the kitchen. They respond, they react to, to uh, the word, to the sound or to the word. So they start this process or start this stage of understanding. Okay, next at 12 months two, uh, when they become one, uh, most babies will be able to produce a word. They will be able to speak. So before one, they just cry and they just make cooing and gurgling sounds. But when they reach one, they start to understand, but not that much, just a few repeated words. And they start... Um, the first production of a word, just one word or two words, just one word or two words, okay? So not so many, not so many words. And a word that each one uh, recognizes. okay? So it's easy to recognize and to know what he or what she says. When they are two, a year later, when they are two, um, they can produce more about uh, at least 50 words. This is what uh, Professor Spada and Professor Lightbound think, or this is what they stated based on the research they did in classrooms or the research they did uh, in, in, in about second language learning and teaching. So they said that by the age of two, old babies, um, they can produce at least 50 different words. You see how, how language developed here. It, it, it developed really quickly. And about, the, about this time, uh, they begin to do something else, which is to combine words, to put words together. So at age two, we have a great progress in language development. As we have something with, which you can see. We have a production of at least 50 words and young children or sorry uh, old babies they 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 start to um, combine words to put words together to form simple sentences 
such as daddy go, daddy go, I hungry, baby sleep, mommy water. These are sentences. Why, why they are called sentences? Of course, you, you, you can see that these are not sentences, these are just phrases. Okay, nice, great. But um, according to the authors, these are called telegraphic, telegraphic sentences. And uh, these two or, or three word sentences are called telegraphic um, because the, 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 uh, the function words and grammatical morphemes are taken away from these sentences. For example, daddy go, it should be uh, uh, daddy is going or daddy goes, for example. I hungry, it should be I am hungry. Baby sleep, baby is sleeping or baby wants to sleep. Mommy water, mommy needs water, for example, or mommy uh, uh, think about uh, a function word or a grammatical word that might add uh, meaning to these phrases. According to the authors, these are telegraphic sentences, and these telegraphic sentences are called so because function words and grammatical, grammatical morphemes are taken away from them. And although these, these function words and grammatical morphemes are taken away, we, we recognize them as sentences. We identify them as sentences. So when you read, uh, yes, they have a message. They, they convey meaning. Thank you, Marwa. They have a message that the form is wrong, but the content is meaningful. Yes, true. Thank you. Yes, true. Um, so we have here, we have here a meaningful word order. Why, why you got meaning? Because the word order is meaningful. The word order counts here. It does make sense. That's why you count them as, as, uh, uh, as sentences. Okay. Um, the, uh, okay, let's now move to uh, one, one more thing, which is uh, the cognitive and language development. W one last point, one last point regarding the developmental sequences or stages in the language development of children in the first three years is that children's, children's discovery of the language and their progress is related to their cognitive development. And by cognitive, I mean uh, the, mental, the mental processes of understanding how they understand things. So, for example, uh, children do not, they do not use adverbs such as tomorrow, uh, such as uh, last week, until they have full awareness and understanding of time. Before that, they cannot. But once they develop, once they become aware of uh, of, of, of time, uh, the concept of time, they start to use these words as last week, tomorrow, and so on. Another interesting point is uh, they cannot use correctly the linguistic elements needed for expressing their ideas as this takes time. As we said before, it's a process. It takes time and it happens gradually with the passage of time. For example, I give you uh, two examples. Um, children can, they can distinguish between uh, singular and plural long before they can add plural endings. They cannot uh, add plural endings to nouns. They can, they can already distinguish between singular and plural, and then later they can add plural endings. So this comes at a later stage, right? Even, even uh, the correct use of irregular plurals, such as children, people, teeth, feet, these are examples of irregular plurals. They cannot use these uh, irregular plurals in a correct way because this takes even more time until the beginning of the school years. Okay, nice. Now let's, uh, 
let's start with uh, to know more about how, how children acquire some linguistic elements. And in chapter one, we have three, three linguistic elements that are being covered. Gram grammatical morphemes, number two, negation, and number three, questions. How children acquire grammatical morphemes, how they form negatives, and how they start using and asking questions. We'll start with grammatical morphemes. Um, okay, uh, what are grammatical morphemes? Grammatical morphemes are the smallest meaningful units that serve specific grammatical functions. Let's take some examples. For example, the word play, the past tense is played, we added ed. The ed is considered a grammatical morpheme. Why? Because it indicated the past tense. Talking, ing, this is a present progressive, something which is happening now. So the ing has a grammatical function, and these are small units, okay? And they have meaning, they have a grammatical function. Houses, we have house, this is the noun, this is uh, uh, the base, okay? This is the base form. And we have the plural, the regular plural of house is houses. So this letter S is considered a grammatical morpheme. And it has a function which is pluralizing uh, uh, the noun, the word house. These are some, some, so the ED, the ING, and the S, these are grammatical morphemes. Okay, um, one, 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 of the best, one of the best known studies uh, was carried out by Roger Brown in 1973. And he and his colleagues uh, carried out a longitudinal study. And the word longitudinal, it means that it was over a long period of time. They carried out a longitudinal study of the language development of three children, Adam, Eve, and Sarah. These three children, they are American children, and they are from middle-class families. And they were selected from 30 because they were all just beginning to speak, multi, multi-word utterances. They had also highly intelligible speech and they were talking fluently. That's why they were chosen. Okay. The principal, the principal data of the study are transcriptions of the spontaneous speech of the child with mother at home. So uh, this was the focus, transcriptions of the spontaneous speech made by Adam, Eve, and Sarah with their mothers at home. And for each child, uh, at least we have, or, or the study was for two hours, two hours of transcriptions. They were, they, they were obtained every month for about two years. So two hours every month for about two years. Okay, let's now move to the, uh, uh, the grammatical morphemes. Brown, Roger Brown, he studied 14, 14 morphemes, which are obligatory in English. The sequence in which they appeared, how, how this is really interesting. Uh, how grammatical morphemes start uh, and how they develop and how they end. We, we are talking about children in their first three years, and we are focusing on how they acquire grammatical morphemes. So the first morpheme they learn is the ing. The first morpheme children learn in the first three years, or let's say in their uh, first four years, 
is the ing uh, example baby crying they say baby crying this is what a child says he says or she says baby crying baby crying okay um, and the age is between 19 to 28 months so some 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 children do this when they are 19 some others when they are 20 21 26 but the maximum is 28 because after 28 they do something else next one uh beware that this is how it happens this is the the right order it has a certain order what happens next is the preposition on like book on table he did not say or she did not say the book is on the table it's not about grammar <clears throat> just uh says produces uh, some words okay book on table from 27 to 30 next preposition in 27 to 30 plural regular daddy have pens okay past possessive and then uh, 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 the verb to be the auxiliary verb and then the articles past regular the third person regular the third person and so on until we reach the the last one uh, the child can use uh, uh, the contractable auxiliary like mommy is crying this is a full sentence from 30 to 50 months this is what roger brown found out and this is uh, his table okay the findings let's now come up to, to, to the findings so uh, brown brown and, and his colleagues they concluded that between the ages of two and four years children gradually gradually acquired different morphemes a variety of different morphemes in their speech as we have seen in the table next the second finding that there is a developmental sequence or order of acquisition in other words children do acquire these morphemes following a certain sequence following a certain order next one and this is really uh interesting um when 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 children acquire these grammatical morphemes brown brown and his uh, colleagues they they found that a child who had mastered the grammatical morpheme at the bottom of the list had also mastered those at the top okay so if if they master uh, uh let's say yes if they master uh, the, the bottom, they also master the top. I, I think that, okay, uh, it's the opposite here. I need to correct this, okay. So again, so if, if children um, master, or let's say uh, he discovered, they found out that children who had mastered the grammatical morphemes at the bottom, at the bottom of the list, had also mastered at the top, but not the opposite. So I, I need to correct this. So this mark should be here, okay? Um, next point is that there is similarity. There is a considerable similarity regarding the sequence. So uh, children are somehow similar in which the different morphemes appeared. And number five, there is little correspondence between the inclusion, between the acquisition of separate morphemes and chronological age, which means that children do not, they did not acquire the morphemes at the same age or rate. Uh, and and what, what he found out exactly that, for example, Eve, uh, Eve this, this girl Eve had mastered nearly all the morphemes before she was two and a half, while Sarah and Adam were, were still working on them when they were three and a half or four. So the order is similar, but the age is, uh, is different. 
And here we have uh, a question before, before we move to the next one. Um, we have a question here. Why, 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 these, why these grammatical morphemes are acquired in this order? I need to go back. Why are they, why are they acquired uh, in this order? The answer is given, the answer is given by, by the authors who stated that this is because of how often, how often the parents use these morphemes in their speech. So we, we are here talking about the frequency, how often children listen to their parents. And the second reason is the cognitive complexity of the grammatical meaning. So uh, the, the first one is the easiest and the last one is the most difficult. And the third reason is the difficulty of pronouncing them. So uh, as you go, as you go below, as you move below the table, uh, things become somehow difficult in terms of pronunciation. Okay. Now uh, the last thing to cover today, and this this will be the last uh, point, is negation. Negation. Uh, this is the second linguistic element, and actually, children they they learn negation very early, and uh, they they negate. They say no, for example, when when they want to uh, comment on the disappearance of objects, when they refuse someone's proposal or suggestion, when they reject an assertion, and so on. And according to someone called a researcher called Louis Plume in 1991, he carried some longitudinal studies. And according to him, according to these studies, this really happens at a single word level, or let's say gestures. So a child, if a child uh, wants to negate something, he just uh, uses gestures, or just uses one word. Of course, it takes time. It takes time, some time before they can express this in sentences. So using sentences to negate something, uh, it, this happens later. Okay, uh, let's, not, let's now uh, move to the stages. So stage one, we have different stages uh, in the development of negation. Stage one, Negation is usually expressed by the word no. So he starts negating by saying no. Um, as the first word, let's say, uh, just says no, or uh, he says no as the first word in the utterance, like no cookie, no comb hair. Then later, stage two, utterances grow longer. So we have long utterances and children start to include the subject, the subject sentences. And uh, sometimes the negative word appears like uh, the word don't. Sometimes they use the word uh, don't, okay? Like daddy, daddy, no comb her or don't touch that. Stage three, we have complex sentences. So the negative element is inserted into a more complex sentence. Children may add forms of the negative other than no. They, 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 they include words like can't, like don't, and they start forming uh, sentences which are more complex than, than in stage one and stage in stage two. In stage one, no sentences, just, just words and the word no is inserted. And then in stage two, uh, long utterances, but no, no sentences. And he starts to use uh, don't, for example. But in stage three, we have a complete sentence, a complete complex sentences. Of course, of course these, these are not complex sentences for us, but for a child, these are considered complex sentences. Or, or, we, or for, for us as parents, as parents, uh, uh, we, we, we think uh, we, we, when a child, when my child says, I can't do it, I can't do it, 
this is really uh, uh, perfect. This is excellent, an excellent sentence. And we, we, we consider this sentence as a complex one when uh, listening to this sentence coming from a child who is about uh, three or two, two or three years old. Okay. Um, before we move to stage four, I need to just comment on something. These sentences like, I can't do it, or he don't want it. These sentences, uh, they, they, they appear to follow the correct English pattern of attaching the negative to the auxiliary. So uh, we have the word can't, we have the word don't, and they are attached to I, I can't, and he don't, so this makes sense. Okay, however, however, children do not, they, they do not vary these forms of different persons or, or, or tenses. So, so uh, this does not mean that they can use correct English. It happened this way. It does not mean that my child can do it in a correct way. He said he don't want it. He doesn't say, or he did not say, uh, <coughs> he didn't say he doesn't want it. Stage four, and this will be the end for tonight. Uh, stage four, children begin to attach the negative element to the correct form of auxiliary verbs, such as do and be. Example, you didn't have supper. She doesn't want it. So at stage four, so uh, I need you to, to compare stage three with four. In stage four, we have much more correct sentences. She doesn't want it. So we have correct use of that negative and the form of, of auxiliary. This, this happens uh, at stage, at stage uh, four. Uh, this is the end for, for tonight. Um, I think this is quite enough for uh, an intro. And of course, we will go on with the book. Next month, we will move to uh, the third linguistic element, which is questions. And then we will cover the theories and the three school years and the school years until we finish, inshallah, chapter one, maybe in two or three months. So any questions? I'm done. So if you have any questions, please write in the chat box. Okay, Are wonderful presentation, Dr. Rafias. I'm here. Yeah. Thank you. That's what, a, what a, an, an astounding presentation and, and, and a very big effort from you. Yeah. <laughs> I know yeah, that this, yeah. this is a tough this is a tough topic. It's uh, purely academic. Um, yeah, I indeed. myself wasted so much time preparing these materials and it's it's really uh, <laughs> a tedious job. But it's yeah. okay, I like it. And this is uh, a wonderful, a wonderful area of research, and I think that it, it it's needed by 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 teachers and learners. We all need uh, to know uh, how how we learn languages, how how the process started, and how it develops. Yeah, yeah, great. So everyone, we're we're waiting for your questions, Ms. Morwasefia. Yes, yes, sir. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Um, I had just a few questions and a comment, doctor. Would you yeah. allow me? Two questions yeah, sure. and a comment. Yeah, okay. After studying this research, um, should we take it for granted? Uh, I mean, should we take the, the findings for granted? Are these like fixed rules or something? Or is it something controversial because we are dealing with humans? okay in different contexts and different cultures and different horizons and mentalities okay this is question number one question number two are you completely with these findings okay are you with them or against some of them maybe can you tell us about this your own viewpoint about it um the comment is that uh when i come to study the book i will concentrate on the purpose of studying this book okay so i'll not study it in order to to know how it develops and uh, and the, the learning acquisition of a language uh, maybe happens I know I know how it happens because uh, of course I'm a mother I have children I can observe I can notice but I should know that when I'm I get to study this 
I have to bear in mind the fact that it's good for linguistics, uh, for people who are uh, putting curricula, how to utilize them in EFL and ESL teaching process itself. It's not uh, merely for the purpose of doing research and that's all, no. We have to know the purpose, we have to apply them after knowing them. So that's the, these are the questions and that's the comment. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, for, yeah, I, I agree with you for, for, uh, uh, for what, what, what you said, what you have just said. Uh, as for your first question, should we take uh, the ideas and the findings for granted? Of course not. Nothing can be taken for granted. These are just uh, 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 theories. And you know that theories are liable to change. Theories uh, are not taken for granted. Uh, we have different learning contexts, we have different teaching contexts, we have different uh, environments, so we cannot agree on completely 100% on the findings. These, these are just uh, ideas to be taken into consideration when dealing with children at home, when teaching them, and so on. So they just give you some ideas, but you, 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 you as a teacher, as a learner, as a parent, you have to think and to know how far this is true or not true. So as, you, as, as for your first question, of course not, nothing can be taken for granted. Everything is developing, everything is liable to change and we have different contexts and different teaching and learning environments. Uh, are you with these findings? Uh, so your question is, do you agree or disagree? Uh, actually, uh, I somehow agree. I somehow agree. Uh, and why somehow? Because um, I'm, I haven't worked as a teacher teaching young learners. So uh, we need to listen more to uh, to what, 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 what young learners, what teachers in teaching young children, what, what do you think? Uh, I haven't experienced this myself. Um, so I, I can't say that I completely agree and I can't say that I completely disagree. Some ideas that are presented here are true. I agree with them 100%. And some of them uh, need to be investigated. They need to be explode more. So uh, this is uh, what, what I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Mm, any more questions? Okay, guys, we're we're waiting for some other questions if you have. Can I say something, Iman? Yes, sure, please. Um, hello. Hello. Uh, this is Iman, and uh, <clears throat> first of all, I'd like to thank you so much for your beneficial, very, very beneficial uh, thank session. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> And uh, there is something I would like to add, uh, actually, on the comment Marwa said, or uh, or the standpoint uh, of this uh, of this research. Mm -hmm. So I, um, of course, I know that it is um, more uh, oriented uh, around uh, young learners. But let me tell you something. Now I am uh, I'm 27, and mm -hmm. I started uh, I started learning uh, French when I was when I uh, when I was um, 25 or something, and. Uh, let me tell you something that was for me just just learning like learning a new language from scratch was just like learning how to talk uh, as if I was a child and uh, what everything said in this research was actually happening to me like for example uh, for example when you said negation when they started to say when the when the kids start to say no and uh, they use it uh, in, instead of the complex structure, for example. Uh, actually, that happened to me. I started to use pa and no uh, um, as um, like negation, but not in a complex structure because I was, I was still in the beginning of, mm -hmm. uh, of my learning process. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And same with a complex structure in, in anything else. I mean, in um, using, uh, for example, um, sentences like in different tenses. Okay. So, I mean, yes, projecting uh, all of these things uh, on us learning any new language or young learners, of, of course, or uh, adult learners, that would actually apply. So that was my point. Okay, so you think that what has been what has been covered today uh, is really true. It happened to you. you have a, a first hand experience. Exactly, when, like a new learner in a new language. I'll be a young learner. And when when, when did you start learning French? Uh, on, on my twenty fifth, uh, it was uh, like when I was twenty five. Okay, I'm so twenty seven we now. So it, so you you were adult. You you were not a child. Yes, exactly. But still, I acted like I was a young learner. Wow, wonderful. So you, you went through the same stages. Exactly. That's why I can relate so well to, to everything being said in this session. So yes, mm-hmm. I understand that, uh, that's, that uh, young learners would suffer from uh, creating like a complex structure or uh, using simple words to uh, convey the meaning or say un- okay. uh, what, unordered what sentences. Is, what, what is the thing that you found not, not applicable, not applying to you? Actually, nothing. 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 I mean, nothing. Everything was so applicable and so relatable. That's why I said that it's so relatable because even the, the examples you gave, were like were like you know ringing a bell in my mind <laughs> mm. in in some in some stage uh, in my uh, learning process mm. interesting interesting thank yeah. you thank you thank you thank uh, you. lovely 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 contribution thank you okay um so um uh, any more questions can we have more sessions of this please during yeah, the sure it's it's, it's, a, it it's two, a series of sessions oh, yeah enough? it's it's a series of webinars. We're gonna have so many sessions uh, and webinars about this book with Dr. Raif, so don't worry about it. For, for, yeah. My, my two, purpose, two sessions my... a month, not only. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, uh, one session, one session at least. Uh, uh, actually, my purpose, my purpose is to uh, discuss the page, uh, sorry, discuss the book. Uh, page by page, line by line, I do not skip anything in the book. I cover everything from A to Z or from A to Z, from cover to cover. So my purpose is to discuss and make a few comments on uh, on, on the whole book. So I, I don't know uh, for, for how long, how long it takes me to, to finish this, maybe uh, more than a year, but I think to, just to uh, not to waste much time, maybe two sessions per month is, is fine, maybe. Uh, but I, I have uh, other plans to give you more uh, other sessions on different topics other than second language acquisition. That's why uh, I, I, I spoke to Mr. Mohammed Nabil about my intention to give two sessions on Educast per month, one on the book and another one on uh, another topic and another area i'm not going to say it now right now it, it's a secret you will discover it later it's another discipline uh, i'm not i'm not actually uh, going to uh, cover issues related to methodology related to uh, tefl uh, okay uh, i'm not focusing on teaching i'm not focusing on uh, how to teach or teaching methodology i'm focusing more on second language acquisition and another area which be, will be uh, a surprise, a big surprise for you, okay? But I'm not, I'm not going to say it right now. Let's keep it a secret. <laughs> a surprise, yeah. a big and surprise. Let me add, let me add to this. Session, You're welcome, yeah. thank you. Yeah, okay. let me add to this, uh, that we are talking about uh, another book uh, by Scott um, Thornbury, which is 30 Language Teaching mm-hmm. Methods. Uh, we have a podcast. Uh, I think I've I've finished ten episodes so far. Maybe wow. yeah. I'm working on the eleventh one. Uh, I'm trying to summarize what is he talking about regarding teaching methods from the very beginning. Okay. Um, yeah. So I want to tell you something today. Uh, inshallah, uh, next month I'll be starting uh, my teacher training course with EduCast AG. It's um, 
it's called or it's entitled um, How to Teach English. It will be held uh, on four days, um, four hours a day. So we have about 16 hours. Uh, on the first day, we have how to teach reading, how to teach listening. On the second day, how to teach writing, how to teach speaking. On the third day, how to teach uh, vocabulary and grammar and how to clarify the meaning in both of them. And the last day will be some kind of teaching practice. Yeah. So it was an it, it's an intensive one, and it will be, uh, you know, affordable, really affordable. Think, th think because, about adding one, one more session on classroom management. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I was thinking about that. Classroom management is really important, and um, giving feedback, providing learners with feedback, because it's a, a really important one. Inshallah, I will be providing with you with the details on the Facebook page um in a week okay uh also we have a tkt course yeah actually we're still working on it and we'll be uh telling you all about it once it's done once it's ready um we also have a silta tutor working with us yeah and she will be delivering uh wonderful courses with us inshallah again 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 let me tell you something else our free webinars will stay will remain free forever inshallah okay so that's another service okay guys so i was honored to have had you today you and uh, dr raif uh, azab uh, it was a wonderful session indeed and we're looking forward to seeing you in in, in some other webinars again i'm, I'm gonna drop the link of the attendance form so that you can attendance in the chat box. Please fill in the form, type your full name uh, so that you can get your certificate of attendance. So <coughs> thanks again, everyone. Let me remind you that we're having another webinar with me. I'll be uh, presenting on how to clarify the meaning and sorry about the background noise because of my children today. Um, so how to clarify the meaning and vocabulary and grammar. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So thanks everyone and see you in another webinar.